quite a few people who who um, follow us regularly. And um, you're right, it's a community. It is a community. There's a there's a quite healthy online community there's too. But we see his comments still. But the thing, but the thing is, is with that online community, I want an in-person community because the online community, you're like a fellowship. I want the fellowship. It's one thing to have money coming in online and, and all that stuff to help keep the doors open. Sure, that that's beneficial. Yeah. But I want people here so I can hang out with them. Yes, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing, no. Mm -hmm. And so it's not good enough to me. That I, I don't want to pack a room just to have a church. I want friends. Mm -hmm. Really. I want a family. I want friends. I want relationships. Yes. And that's the biggest thing that I want. But let's go ahead and look at uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses uh, 17 through 21 today. And I'm going to preach on what is called following the correct pattern. Following the correct pattern. We have many patterns in life. By which we can uh, we can follow, and um, well, actually, just two patterns in life by which we can follow. We can follow the pattern of the world, or we can follow the pattern of Paul, as Paul says in in, in First Corinthians, "Imitate me as I imitate Christ Jesus." And we say that a lot here in the church. We go on how we go on and on and on about how our main purpose in life is to have a relationship with Christ by glorifying Him, serving Him, and imitating God. Being an accurate image of who God is. And we harp on that because it's so true. It's so important to remember that we were created to imitate our Father. And the best imitation that we can do is to imitate the perfect image of, of the invisible God, which is Jesus Christ Himself. And that's why God, well, that's why Jesus is the perfect a pattern to follow. But in Philippians, um, Paul is, is pretty much in a roundabout way saying, hey, follow me. Follow our pattern. Follow what we do instead of following the pattern of the false teachers of the day. So let's look at this verse. Uh, the, uh, in Philippians 3, chapter, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 17, Paul says, brethren, which, of course, he's pointing out the fact that he's talking to believers here. It's brethren, uh, uh, believers in Christ, people who have been adopted into the family of God. He says, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. So he says, note those who so walk. And, that's, and I have that highlighted red up on your screen because... Those are the people who are walking contrary to the pattern and people who are walking according to the pattern. So he's saying, look at the people around you and say, look at the people who are walking according to us and people who are not walking according to us and choose a side. Choose a side. There's no neutrality here. You're either walking with us or you're walking against us. And you're going to see that developed here in, uh, in the next few verses. But... What this is more or less saying is that everyone follows a pattern, and you have to pick the correct pattern. And this isn't a game. This isn't that. This isn't just a test that God's given us. This is life and death. This is something that we have to choose to do. There's consequences to not doing it, and we'll get into that more today. But choosing that correct pattern is so vital. Not only to our eternity, but it's also in, it's it's also vital to every aspect of our health. It's vital to our uh, not only our spiritual health, but it's vital to our emotional health, to our psychological health, and to our emotional health. It is physical, emotional, spiritual, and psychological health. Following the right pattern is vital to all four of them. And that's why we have to look at the examples in this passage, guys. It is so, so, so vital. So let's look at this. Choosing the correct pattern of life to follow is vital for our health. Why? Number one, the pattern of Christ's enemy enemies harm us. Harm us. Let's look at Philippians 3, 18 through 19. He's talking about those people who do not 
walk according to their pattern. Look, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So that's a lot to unpack there. But he's describing the people first who do not follow the pattern set forth by the apostles. Because remember, what did Paul say? Imitate me as I imitate Christ Jesus. And or and in the KJV it says, follow me as I follow Christ Jesus. It's the same idea. Following means imitating a pattern, imitating a lifestyle, imitating a way of life. So the people who refuse to follow the Christian way, refuse to follow Paul's way, are the people described here. They are the people described here. So how are they described according to that verse? Well, number one, they are described as ones who are going to destruction. So if we follow their pattern, they're going to be leading us into destruction. They're going towards destruction, so if we follow them, we're going to follow them to their destruction, guys. Now, we got to be careful with that, because as a believer, obviously, we can't lose our salvation. We're not going to go to hell. But in the earthly sense of things, in the temporal sense of things, whatever they uh, reap from their actions, we're going to be reaping the same thing if we follow their pattern. So the destruction, in a different sense, is very, very real for us. But let's look at that. Um, he says, For many a uh, walk of whom I told you often, and now tell you, uh, tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. I have there uh, highlighted, whose end is destruction. So, we're, so look at that. That's the first thing that we have highlighted, verse 19, whose end is destruction. These people are enemies of Christ and enemies of the cross of Christ, and their end is destruction. So what does that mean, their end being destruction? Well, we know right off that if you are unsaved, mm -hmm. right? Hell, as we've said many, many, many times before, is not a punishment. Oscar, what is hell? It's hell. not a punishment. Hell is uh, separation. It's not a punishment. It is judgment. It's judgment. judgment. And what does judgment do? It it's, um, destroys. destroys. See, hell takes the whole being, all of you. Your entire being, your body, your soul, and your spirit, and it destroys it completely. Not annihilates it, but destroys it. It's a conscious, knowing destruction. When you are in hell, yes, your body is burning. It's being destroyed, but it's never consumed. So the construction, the, the destruction is eternal. It's ongoing. It burns, but it's like the burning bush. It burns, but it's never consumed. It just burns and burns and burns. And it's like an act of eternal destruction. The soul and the spirit is the same thing. It destroys your identity. It destroys your freedom. It destroys your hope. It yeah. destroys your confidence. It destroys everything about your soul except for your existence. The only thing that hell leaves is your ex existence. It takes everything else from you. Mm -hmm. It destroys everything. Even your very hope. Mm -hmm. It is destruction that lasts forever. Yeah. Don't make light of it though. Because, because don't make light of it though. Because this is a real thing. And people online even need to know this guys. Yeah. That this is a real thing. 
if the Bible is true, and this yes. is God's revealed world, a uh, revealed word, mm -hmm. he says that when we rejected his law, mm -hmm. him being good and him being just and him being holy requires him to destroy anything contrary. Mm -hmm. To get rid of it. Get rid of it. And that's either true or it's false. And that's something that we as human beings have to decide for ourselves. Is this a trustworthy statement within the Bible? Yeah. Or is this something I'm going to disregard and take my chances on? And let me tell you, folks, the Bible and everything that can be trusted and, and everything that can be tested has been confirmed to be either true or plausible. Nothing has been proven false, so therefore it's a trustworthy document. And I don't want to gamble my eternity on something that's never, on, on, on uh, uh, by disbelieving something that's from a book that's never been proven wrong. That doesn't seem reasonable to me. It doesn't. We make light of this all too often, like people out there saying, I'll see you in hell. It's like, no, you won't. Don't make fun of it. Don't make light of it. This is serious stuff. This isn't a game. And you can mock it. You can scoff at it. You can disbelieve it. You can laugh at it. You can giggle at it. You can try to brush it up underneath the rug. You can do everything you want at it. But on Judgment Day, you're going to realize whether you're saved or you're uh, lost on Judgment Day, you're going to realize real quick how real, how real it is. Either you're going to be drug off and thrown into the very pits of hell by two angels, you know, dragging you off to the pits of hell, or you're going to be probably witnessing others going there. It's going to become very real. And you're going to uh, be looking back at your life and thinking to yourself, why did I make light of it? This is stinking horrible. <coughs> You know, it leads us to destruction. Destruction. If we follow the wrong pattern. As a believer, we won't go to hell. But believe me, if you follow the pattern of unbelievers as a believer, there's some temporal consequences that you will share in. It is real. But number two, after leading us to destruction, if we follow the wrong pattern, it will... Uh, it will force us to follow our gut instead of follow Christ. As we said many times before, if you follow the wrong pattern, what are you doing? You're setting up a different foundation. And your foundation is humanism. It is mainly yourself. Look at what he says. Whose God is their belly. In, in other words, they follow their gut, in other words. They follow, they follow their desires. They follow what they want. They become autonomous. They become their own standard. They become their own authority. They become their own moral compass. They become their own source of truth. They become ultimately their God. Their, whose God is their belly. They become their own God. Little G. That's what happens when you follow the wrong pattern. And guys, think about the consequences of doing that. As we said in apologetics class, over and over and over and over and over again, when you make God, when you make your belly your God, what ends up happening is you're relying on your finite, limited information and knowledge to make life-altering decisions. You're basing all of your decisions on how you feel and how you reason and on how you think and, 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 and your emotions at that point. You're following your gut. Man, that sounds good on the surface, but look, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your uh, paths. And the heart is deceitful all th above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In other words, in the Hebrew, who can understand it? Who can know that it's true? How, who can know that it's trustworthy?
worthy. Because it's deceitful. It's not a guide that we can follow, guys. When you make it into your when you make your gut into your own authority, and when you make your gut into your own standard of truth, it's gonna lead you to that destruction. Oscar, this is why I plead with you, man. Mm. Plead with you. Fall yes. in love with that book. Yes. Become obsessed with it. Obsessed. I'm preaching to myself here, too. Become obsessed with it. Become addicted to it. Fall in love with that book. Let it saturate and absolutely drench your soul to where you ooze Bible and think Bible every day to where you base every decision of your life on Scripture. Do not lean on your own understanding. Do not let your gut be your God. Let the God who wrote those pages be your God. There's a big difference. To see, better yet, the God who wrote those pages, if you're saved, indwells you. Follow Him. He will keep you from falling into that destruction that Paul is talking about. See, because the destruction lead, uh, the destruction actually comes from following your belly, making your belly into a God. So it forces us to follow our gut instead of Christ. But look what else it does. It convinces us what shames us actually glorifies us. Isn't that interesting? It turns... See, it's deceptive. It calls good evil and evil good. Yes. You know, I think of in today. I, I hate to always bring this back, but it's so relevant today because because how, because of the utter blasphemy and the utter just crazy unbiblical uh, nature of this. Think about the gay movement. Mm -hmm. What do they What do they call it? They call it. Right. See, they're glorifying. They think it brings them glory. They're prideful over it. They think it's something to be celebrated. They think it's something to be cherished. They think it's something that they should throw parades over. They think it's something that they should be teaching our kids. They think it's something that should be plastered on the side of a beer can. They think it's something that should be waved on a rainbow flag as a banner out in the streets. They think it's something that should be flown on a flagpole over a state capitol building. It's celebrated. They think it's glorious. They think it's Wonderful. They think it's something. But what does God say about it? And what does anybody with a moral compass say about it? We say it's shameful. shameful. It's shameful. They think it brings them glory. But the vast majority of people in this world who still have somewhat of a moral compass that tells them that God created man in his own image, and in the image God created him... And and because of that, we are supposed to imitate the Trinity and Christ in the church. We're supposed to imitate Him correctly. We're supposed to pattern our relationships after that, our marriages after that. We're supposed to, in essence, pattern our relationships and marriages in worship after Him. And we corrupt it, call it glorious, when God says, that's a stink. Shame. See, calling good evil and evil good. That is what ends up happening there. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Man, oh man, this is what happens. When you follow your gut and you follow the wrong pattern, to those who know better and who are discerning and who know right and wrong and who follow an untainted conscience, you're not glorious to them. You're shameful. And this goes well beyond the homosexual thing. Think about Christians. 
like like the guy who trolled me on um, on YouTube that one time for being a nonprofit organization who called me a worker of Satan and 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 who called me someone who's sold out to the devil because I allow people to take uh, take uh, tax deductions mm -hmm. like somehow I'm giving into the Satan's uh, Satan's demonic plan for our nation. And I had to explain to him that churches are automatically tax deductible. I didn't file for anything and 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 all that stuff. And I also had to explain to him that uh, some other things regarding that to where it's not unbiblical. See, he thought he was doing God a, a, God a service. By saying that, and you could see this on our YouTube page, by the way. He thought that he was doing God a service by saying that, that he was bringing the glory to God, when in reality, he was stepping outside of the pattern of Scripture. He's stepping outside of the pattern of conduct, and he was bringing shame to himself. That's another example of it. We do it all the time. When Westboro Baptist Church goes outside and waves uh, signs against homosexuals calling, calling them derogatory names and saying that God hates them in a derogatory fashion. They think they're glorifying God. No, you're bringing shame to the Christian name. Right? See, mm -hmm. this is what happens when you follow your gut instead of the pattern. Should we preach against homosexuality? Of course. Yes, Should we preach against corruption in the church? Of course. Should we preach against sin? Of course. But how? Do we beat people over the head with them like a sledgehammer like Bill Jack would say? Or do we pry their heads open like with a crowbar? Do we try to reason with them? Do we try to speak truth in love? Are we nice? and sweeping sin under the rug, ignoring it? No. Are we bigots beating them over the head with the Bible, no. expecting them to change apart from the Holy Spirit? No. But do we speak the truth in love and kindness and gentleness like Jesus did, relying on the Holy Spirit to change hearts? What pattern do we follow? <coughs> That is the thing, because if you follow the wrong pattern, your glory is going to turn into shame. You're going to be glorying in your shame. It's going to be really bad. The more they increase, the more they sin against me. I will change their glory into shame. Hosea 4.7 so this is talking about how they moved away from God. They were glor being glorified in all their earthly possessions, in all their earthly wealth, in all their prestige, and says that I'll, bring, I'll turn their glory in shame. Period. Wow, guys. So it leads us into destruction. It forces us to follow our gut instead of Christ. It convinces us uh, what shames us actually glorifies us. But it also tempts us to seek the temporal. Following the wrong pattern will tempt us to seek the temporal. Look at 19, the last part. Who set their mind on earthly things. That verb there, set their mind. It's not like they just think about it every now and then. They have made it their goal. They set their mind on everything that's temporal. In other words, heavenly things don't even enter it. They never even pay a moment's attention to the things of God. Eternity is not on their hearts. They don't think about life after death. They don't think about judgment day. They don't think about heaven. They don't think about hell. They don't think about the will of God. They don't think about the consequences to their actions. They don't think about what God thinks, what God wills for their life. They don't think about any of that. All they think about is what? Their own belly. They are their God. They are the pattern. It's humanism. That's what they want. Don't do it. Set your, mind th set your mind on things above, not 
on things of earth. Galatians, Colossians 6, uh, 3, 2. Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys or where thieves do not break in and steal. And then the parallel pa passage in Luke 12, 33. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old and treasure in heaven in the heavens that do not fail, where thieves, uh, where no thief approaches, nor moth destroys. The point is, guys, is everything on earth, everything you see, one day is going to literally burn. Literally burn. Peter tells us that everything will melt with fervent heat. Everything will burn. None of this that you see around you will last. It's all going to burn. It's all going to be destroyed. It's all going to be taken away. None of it's eternal. Not one thing. We often say that we can't take anything with us, which is true. But I'm going to take a step further. Not everything's going to last. Everything's going to be destroyed. None of it's worth holding on to. We hold on to something that is literally going to burn one day, thinking, oh, this is going to make me happy. When God is like, don't set your mind on that stuff. Set your mind on heaven. Set your mind on the things of heaven where you're going to be storing up rewards and treasures for your good works that no one can take away that isn't going to burn. Because that's the stuff that you're working for and that's the stuff that you'll love. Because another thing that we got to remember is that the Bible says that everything here on earth is given to us for us to be stewards over. None of this stuff even belongs to us, guys. We're a steward of it. But in heaven, they call it an inheritance for a reason. Because the rewards and the status we receive in heaven, the inheritance we receive in heaven, guess what? We're not a steward of that. That actually belongs to us. Mm -hmm. Big difference. None of this belongs to us, but we're working for stuff that will. Man, you know, so so it tempts us to seek the temporal, but the temporal is the stuff that we can't keep. The temporal is stuff that's going to burn. What's the point? What's the point? You know? So therefore, we follow, we follow the pattern of Paul's life and, and how it benefits us. Because look at it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Son of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to this glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. So what does he say here? Number one, if we follow God's pattern, we, he, he, uh, he guarantees us a perfect home. For our citizenship is in heaven. Just this what just this is what I just got finished saying. We have an inheritance. We if we do if we follow the right pattern, one day we will get stuff that actually belongs to us, <coughs> that we actually own. Mm -hmm. Because if we're child of a king, that makes us a prince. We are an adopted child who gets an inheritance, which means we actually own it because we're part of the Creator's family. That's what we're working for. That is the pattern by which we live. Adoption. Think about that. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. 
But B, after guaranteeing us a perfect home, he guarantees us the hope of redemption. Look at 21 through 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also wait for the Savior, for, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, will wait on his return. Because when he returns, guys, this is a big thing. When he returns, he redeems. That's when he transforms. That's when we will receive what we need. Look at Acts 1.11. Also, who also said, men of Galilee, this is the angel speaking at uh, Jesus' ascension. Why do you stand gazing up in the heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you in the heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go in the heaven. He's going to come back down and touch down on this very mount, the second coming. That's what we look forward to. And then 1 Corinthians 15, I'm not going to read it, but this is talking about how in a, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, the rapture will be changed. Taken on an incorruptible body. Taken on a body that will not perish, will not rot, will last forever. It's part of our inheritance. But see, guaranteeing, this is last thing, guaranteeing to destroy evil rule according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself in order to take over an evil world you got it you got to get rid of the evil and revelation talks about a lot of that and Isaiah goes as far as saying that when the Messiah returns to set up his kingdom in eternity his robe will be drenched in blood See, this is the hope we're looking for. This is what we're wanting to do. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, 8, 15, 18. Now when all things are made subject to him, the Son himself will also be made to be subject to him and put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So what this is really coming down to is this, guys. The moral, this is, this is the meat and taters, okay? This is what I'm really wanting people to understand. We can't be making light of life anymore and making light of our culture and making light of the Word of God. Because here are five little points that I'm wanting everyone just to internalize. God destines all evil for destruction. Period. Take a look around. One day... Even most human beings, Oscar, mm -hmm. will burn. Mm -hmm. Even human beings, most, pretty much everything, will burn. Whether the earth and the universe melting with the fervent heat, or the unsaved person who never accepts the gospel burning in hell, Everything evil will burn. It's destined for destruction. B, God has given man a way out to be saved in Jesus. And of course, this is, you know, Jesus dying in our place. For people online, Jesus is fully God, fully man. He, he lived a perfect life, only be rejected and nailed to a cross, taking the punishment for our sin upon himself so we didn't have to have been raised from the dead. And if we just simply acknowledge that we have broken God's law, which we have, everyone has stolen, everyone has lied, everyone has done things that are against God's will. If we acknowledge that and say, Lord, I trust that you took my punishment. Please save me. He promises he will. And that saves us from that destruction if we trust in it. So, Oscar, think this through. This is a matter of life and death, good and evil. When we're out here in this world, we have to look at it in the right light. There has been a line drawn in the sand. And we can't think of God as this fluffy, big teddy bear anymore. We can't. We often emphasize his love and emphasize his grace and emphasize his mercy. And that's a great emphasis because without it, we wouldn't be saved. 
But for the vast majority of people out there, guess what? That grace and that mercy is going to be running out, brother. It's not eternal. People are going to burn. The world is going to burn. One day, God is going to right all of these wrongs. And it's going to be nasty. And here we are, we parade ourselves around here saying, I'm saved by the grace of God and, and all this stuff. And, and what do we do? All we're really doing is just straddling that line. The line's been drawn in the sand. He's saying, hey, you've got the evil and you've got the good. I've separated you from the evil. The evil, I'm getting ready to burn. Why, are you still, why do you still have one foot in it? Why are you straddling the line? Whose side are you on? Are you on mine or are you on theirs? Repentance is deciding to take a side. It's realizing that I no longer want to be on the side of evil. Instead, I want to be on the side of good. And Lord, I need your help to be on the side of good. I can't do it. I can't defect in my own power. I can't defect from the, from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light by myself. I need you to carry me across the line. I can't do it, but you can. That's repentance. That is going to Christ, realizing that you have nothing to offer him. You're totally and completely hopeless. Completely hopeless. And you're begging him for salvation and for the Holy Spirit's power to do good. You need his help staying on the right side of the line because the other side's getting ready to burn. All of it. Everything. Our eternity is not on this earth. It's on a new heaven and a new earth. All of this is going one day, and the unsaved people are going with it. Pick a side. As I said, point E, life is not a game. This is good and evil, life and death. Don't trivialize it. Don't giggle at it. Don't make light of it. Realize that this is the most serious thing in existence. It is more important than any legal matter that you'll face in life. It's important than any earthly war that you'll fight. It's, it's more important than any enemy you'll face. It's, it's, it's more important than any court hearing that you'll face. It's, it's more important than any trial that you'll have to go through. It's more important than any scuffle that you have with another human being. The most important thing on earth is realizing that everything's getting ready to burn and humans are included. Which side are you on? Are you straddling the line or have you picked a side? That is the mindset that we have to have. We need to repent and pick a side and be serious about it and live it and follow that pattern, which is the pattern that Jesus set forth for us to follow. So let's pray, guys. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the great message you laid on my heart today and uh, for the good illustration of a textual sermon for Oscar. And um, I just pray that anyone watching online would be as challenged by this as I am. I have sin in my life, Lord. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I know I'm redeemed. I know that I'm saved by grace. But just like everyone else, I straddle that line at times, Lord. I have one foot in the pits of hell. and the, uh, Well, not in the pits of hell. I have one foot in the muck and the mire and one foot up on the, uh, up on the solid rock. But the thing is, I want to get my foot out of the muck and mire, wash it with the living water, and set it up on the rock, too, and start running away from that line. Start running away from it, Lord, because we can't we can't be doing this anymore. So please help us follow you. 
and be faithful to you and be faithful to one another and just uh, love you with all of our heart and our mind and our strength. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Brian.